Hello, it's Scott Manley here. This week, a paper has been published which has been generating a lot of news because it suggests that an ancient Bronze Age city near the Dead Sea named Tal el Hammam was destroyed by an asteroid about 3500 years ago. This has been compared to the Tunguska event of 1908, where the mainstream conjecture is that a weakly bound rubble pile asteroid or cometary fragment hits the Earth and before it can reach the surface, the atmospheric pressure from the motion breaks it up and it essentially explodes before it reaches the ground. It doesn't leave behind a crater, but it generates this massive air blast and thermal heating equivalent to a multi-megaton nuclear weapon, something that would have a pretty devastating effect on a Bronze Age city. The paper then goes one step further to suggest that this may in fact be the biblical city of Sodom. That's the city that, according to the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, was destroyed by fire and brimstone. You probably know the reference since it's a well-known story that's part of multiple religions. And, you know, even atheists are happy to acknowledge that some of the biblical stories may have links to real events. And a city getting destroyed by a giant fireball from the sky is exactly the kind of thing that would leave a lasting impression on a society for generations and would probably make it into their stories. So, understandably, this is getting a lot of attention because it's got the makings of a good story, right? It sits well with people's preconceived notions and you know, ideas about how the world works and how the world was. The paper is quite long and it includes lots of images of the archaeological site, reconstructions of what it might have been like in its heyday. It shows a large settlement with mud brick buildings, including a fairly substantial palace, a significant population during the Bronze Age. Now, then it brings together many observations of the site as it is today, showing walls that are now fallen with bones inside the dwellings and near the dwellings, suggests that they sudden air blast would topple the mud brick buildings and bury the inhabitants inside. They claim that some of the remains show evidence of heating and they say that there's a destruction layer with debris that shows evidence of high temperatures of burning and fragments of pottery and bricks which show flash melting possibly due to uh, such an event. They, they also claim that there are microscopic diamonds or diamondoids and shocked quark crystals and these these are the kind of uh, things that are only really found in astronomical events because they need these really high pressures and uh, shock waves to generate these uh, characteristic things. Now to be clear they don't argue for an impact right that, that would make a crater in the ground but just an airburst where the weakly bound object is you know, torn apart. And this is actually the most common fate of small asteroids from like a few meters up to maybe as big as 100 meters. They hit the atmosphere and the dynamic pressures build up so quickly that they fragment into their parts before they reach the ground. And the sort of the moment of peak fragmentation generates this blast in the shock wave. And you know, they can do some damage and some fragments do make it to the ground, but you don't end up with this large crater. And this is exactly what we saw in Chelyabinsk in 2013. And this was, of course, documented from every angle by dash cams and smartphone cameras. Uh, it was much smaller than the 1908 Tunguska event in Siberia, which was in the middle of nowhere 100 years ago before dash cams and smartphones. There weren't very many witnesses, but there were hundreds of square kilometers of forest flattened by this blast. And the new paper actually describes their hypothetical scenario as a Tunguska-like event. So anyway, having laid out their argument, I'm going to say that I'm not convinced by this at all. And I'm not saying that it's not true, but I am highly skeptical based on the way some of their claims have been presented in their work. And also a number of experts in various fields who have come forward to point out some glaring problems with their analysis. And I guess the one to follow or to you know, check out is Mark Boslow, who I met in Luxembourg a couple of years ago. He's definitely the most vocal and he's an impact specialist who studied the Tunguska event. He's actually visited the site in Siberia to try and understand the surface effects of these kind of multi-megaton air blasts. One of his objections concerns the claims of finding the shocked quartz, right? That's generally a strong indicator that a hypervelocity impact or nuclear blast took place. It's where a, a quartz crystal in a sort of boring crystalline phase has been hit by a shockwave 
so powerful that it's crushed it down to a higher density crystalline structure. And we only see this under certain conditions. Now, Mark's problem is that he doesn't believe that it's possible for an air blast in the air to generate the quartz because the shock wave in the air doesn't couple strongly to uh, objects on the ground. The extreme pressures needed for this just don't propagate from an air to a solid, right? Because there's a big density difference. The shock wave is reflected instead. So he does point out that the, the images that they show as well of the quartz crystals from various airbursts don't actually look like the shock crystals that he has found from actual impacts. Now the paper actually addresses this and they say that they believe a mechanism has been shown to make shocked quartz from an airburst, specifically the Tunguska event, but their source that they cite, that they point to, is a paper that Mark couldn't find, perhaps because it's not been published yet. So that doesn't really help their case to cite something that doesn't exist. Uh, another scientist, Matthew Boulanger, pointed out that the presentation of the carbon dating is disingenuous. They've dated a number of different sources of things that they assumed all were created at the same time with the same event. And then they basically averaged it. They used a process to <laughs> you know, take the average and then they said, oh, well, look, it looks like they've all been happening at the same age because they took an average. That's, that's sort of cheating. He didn't like that. But those are the bits where I actually sort of understand the physics. I understand carbon dating and impact physics, but I'm not an archaeologist or even a bioarchaeologist. And there's no shortage of people who actually know these fields who are criticizing them. I think most visibly there's Dr. Chris Stantis, who's a bioarchaeologist at the Smithsonian, and she's got experience in the Near East. And her commentary on the human remains actually got turned into this Phoenix Wright style video. So she points out that the authors of the paper argue that finding the buried human remains in buildings with no burial goods shows that events happened quickly and buried them when the buildings collapsed. But it was actually quite a common practice to have intramural burials where the family members were buried near the houses or even under the houses at the time. She also has issues with the number of bone fragments found and the fact that they didn't even try to differentiate between human and animal bone fragments. Uh, and there's another response to the hurt by um, Dr. Megan Perry, who on Twitter bills herself as a professional cynic. That's her words, not mine. Uh, she points out that the authors are portraying the buildings as being destroyed and the human remains laid down in this same catastrophic event, when there's actually very little to suggest or support this. And she goes as far to say uh, that there's nothing atypical about the layering in this site compared to others that you know were formed over centuries of life, death, collapse, and rebuilding. I mean, I can't honestly say if this is this is valid because I, it's outside of my experience. But I would trust this this criticism. Like, I mean, see, here's the thing: it's a paper that crosses all sorts of disciplines: history, archaeology, biology, physics, structural engineering, astronomy, and probably more. And it looks to me as if some of the people that have looked at this they've seen this as a strength. They're like, this is great. It covers all these different fields. It must be good. And that's not necessarily the case because you've got people that are all doing their own little thing and not necessarily forming a complete picture. Um, they've definitely formed a compelling story, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right story. But I, on the other hand, what I noticed was that many of the same authors created a similar paper another study of another archaeological site in the same region of the world claiming that it too was a city that was destroyed by an asteroid airburst 13,000 years ago. And based on the number of asteroid airbursts that we've seen in the last century and the proximity of these two locations, it would be statistically improbable for two of these ancient settlements to be destroyed by asteroids and for this team to have found both of them. That says to me that, that, you know, finding one of these would be an interesting piece of science. Having the same people identifying many of these makes me think that there's some bias involved and they're probably making the mistake of fitting evidence to fit their preconceived conclusions rather than the reverse. And look, I know what this is like because I used to make that mistake all the time. I, you know, when I was doing my postgraduate work, I was a big proponent for raising awareness of the hazards of asteroid impacts, and I still am. 
But back then, I spent a lot of time around people and would have a lot of time drinking in pubs with them, where we'd talk about some interesting historical event and start brainstorming about how we could link it back to an asteroid or a celestial event. And you know, we'd sometimes go back and do some work. And once we left the pub, we'd realize that it didn't make sense. But that desire to fit things to your worldview uh, is, is quite compelling. But going forward, ideally, the team behind this study will allow others to review and analyze the samples that they have. They'll follow up with uh, the analysis that were missed, and maybe they'll be able to counter some of the claims of shoddy work. Because none of the criticisms show that this event didn't happen. They just show that the evidence and the logic is so flawed that an unbiased observer would be unlikely to reach the same conclusion. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.